wars are bad. We're not supposed to like the war in Star Wars. We want it to end. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a, there's a tendency for people not to want stuff shoved in their faces, but they also don't really understand that that's sort of a luxury. Yeah. Welcome to the Skiffy and Fanti Show's interviews. Strap in, suit up, and don't forget to pack some extra glue and tape just in case. <laughs> I'm Sean. I'm Brandon. And joining us on today's show is none other than Andrew Liptak, author of Cosplay, A History from Saga Press, out on June 28th, 2022. Some things about Andrew you might want to know. He is a member of the 501st Legion, which is a really awesome thing I'm contractually obligated to discuss as a result of Order 72, lesser known one of the orders from Star Wars. Just read your books. He's also a well-known science fiction fantasy fan. He's a historian. He's written for places like Kirkus Reviews, Life Hacker, Polygon, The Verge. He's also been in places like Clark's World and Uncanny and many, many other places. He is also the author behind Transfer Orbit, a really fantastic newsletter covering a variety of speculative fiction topics. So welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's very good to be back and chatting with you. Well, we're excited to have you. I think I was on the show like 10 years ago. I, I mean, who knows? Like after COVID, does time mean anything anymore? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No. Well, it's good to have you back. I am really excited about this book in particular because you mentioned it when you were working on it a while back. And I was like, oh my goodness, we are going to learn some stuff. And boy, did we in this book (laughs) because you said many things about cosplay. And so I think the name of the book tells you what it's about. But would you kind of give people like a basic rundown? What is Cosplay a History? The full title is Cosplay a History, colon, the builders, fans, and makers who bring your favorite stories to life. And it's basically my take on how, you know, what is this big community that is fan costuming and cosplay? I don't quite come down on like a very strict definition. I've said this in a couple of other places, but like, I I really don't like definitions and boundaries for these sorts of things. My take on this is basically cosplay and sort of the bigger umbrella that is sort of fan costuming type world is that this is a hobby that you are interacting with a story by wearing a costume. Whether or not that's a fictional costume or based on a fictional character is like where you, I sort of come down on cosplay. But if cosplay is sort of dressing up as fictional characters, reenacting and living history and um, LARPing, those are just really like very close cousins. So uh, sort of the thesis and the core of this story is about the communities that come together to sort of express their fandom by immersing themselves in the world and bringing the worlds to life for people around them. That's the short version. The longer version is about 300 pages of paper and glue and ink. (laughs) So I'm glad you raised this. One of the questions I really wanted to ask you, you are a historian, and this is, in a sense, a history book. And that is a very complicated thing to do, because you can't cover literally everything in any one book, because at that point, you'd probably not have a book coming out, you'd still be writing it, (laughs) and it would be 5000 pages long. And so you have to make decisions as you begin the process of, as you were saying a moment ago, telling the story, essentially, of cosplay, trying to kind of give us a rundown of what that story is. And as a historian, as somebody doing this work, how did you make the decisions on what kind of story you were going to tell in telling a history of this particular, shall we say, art form? Yeah, it's cosplay a history, not cosplay the history. I'll put that out there. And literally, while I was working on the book, we were literally, and I mean literally, literally, up to the last minute, making edits and getting it, shoehorning stuff in. So there's stuff that I didn't get to. Let me start from the beginning. The books are where it originated from. It was February 2016. Joe Monte at Saga Press came to me and with an idea. He had seen the 501st Legion come at San Diego Comic-Con. And in particular, had seen a member who had marched 501 miles from Northern California to San Diego to honor his recently deceased wife. I think she had died of cancer. And he was, you know, intrigued by this. You know, this is a really extreme thing to do. And I should mention, this guy marched that 501 miles in Stormtrooper armor. And he was like, you know, is there a story here? And I was like, yeah, it's a group that's been around for a long time. And I think at that point, it was coming up on the, the 20th anniversary. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary this year. 
And so he was like, is this something you'd be interested in pitching to us? And so put, came up with a pitch about the sort of a beat by beat history of the 501st Legion. That version never came to pass. But as I was working on it, I realized that in order to really put the 501st in context, I needed to go back and sort of understand the boundaries of what cosplay was. Where did cosplay come from? Why did it exist? And how did it evolve up to 1997, where the 501st started? And that was sort of like a chapter in that first proto book. And when we, I went back and retooled the project, and it was like, all right, well, I, I got more fascinated by like, what's the bigger history here? And what is the larger story that is cosplay? And I realized that was a lot more fascinating because the 501st is just a very small part of that. And so basically what I went did is I just sort of plumbed the knowledge that I had. I, I've written about science fiction history for a long time for places that I've written. And so I knew about like the first world con where, you know, Forrest Ackerman and, and Myrtle Douglas showed up in costume. And you know, I knew about Star Trek fans doing costumes at cons and the 501st and websites like the Replica Props Forum. Um, Adam Savage is a member of that. And he had talked about cosplay. So what a lot of it was, was basically putting together an outline and then just sort of putting out a timeline and sort of figuring, all right, this happened here, this happened here. So what are the there's all these blank spaces in between. What happens in between? And then if cosplay sort of gets its start in 1939, what happens before that? And so I started to go back further. So what are early examples of where people have dressed up in costume that weren't really like a theatrical or movie experience, like where people were like fans doing this? And, you know, we found examples. There's other books that have been written about cosplay and they talk about it in other articles and things. And so I started, you know, sort of researching other little high points that I could touch on. And then going even further back, it was like, why are costumes existing in the first place. Why do we dress up in costume? And that was sort of like where we started to hit the core message of the book is like, what is it about costuming that makes this such a powerful art form, an immersive art form and a just a powerful type of storytelling in and of itself. And so, you know, I go back and look at ancient Greek theatrics and then European theater and then theater from all over the world and then sort of work my way up to the timeline to Hollywood and sort of very high level overview. This is not beat by beat history of costuming. This is just sort of to set the stage. What I really found it fascinating in talking to costume designers, like we're talking about costuming as a tool for storytelling. You know, we are storytelling creatures. We, we like to tell stories and we like to bring fidelity to those stories because we are trying to bring the audience along with us. And, to you know, you can imagine a story really well, but like if you have props, you can imagine it even better. If you can describe Darth Vader as a guy with a very scary mask and a dark cloak. But then when you actually get the design for that cloak and that scary mask, yeah, everybody imagines it and they know what it looks like. And so that is a really fascinating thing to me. And so I wanted to explore that element. And so, yeah, a lot of it was just sort of filling in the gaps and just how many of those gaps can you fill in? And there's been so many people who have cosplayed and costumed over the years. It's just hard to, you cannot fill every single one. So, you know, you just sort of pick the ones that are the most relevant to the thesis of the book and that would sort of convey that story. Along the way, you know, you find rabbit holes and go down little side trails and find all sorts of really cool stuff like, you know, what the history of Halloween is and what is like one of the early reenactments that took place in England and, you know, stuff like that. The book, as a result, has a wide range of stuff that I, I like to cover. And I, it was all it was a very fun process. Nice. So one of the things that I thought was particularly interesting about this book, and I found a lot of it interesting. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished. Even as someone who kind of struggles to comprehend cosplay, but is utterly very fascinated by it as an element of fan creativity, two of the things that I thought were particularly interesting was, first of all, I was very excited to learn that fan costuming, which you refer to it a lot as in the very first sessions of the book, predate the word cosplay by a half century as a result of occurring in the first world con, when the assumption that most of the public, especially the non-science fiction fan public, has about cosplay is that it originates in Japan. That's where the word comes from, that's where the performance comes from. And this reinforces that that's not the case, that there is a trend towards this kind of creativity that has existed theoretically before we ever had a word for it. But one of the other things that I thought was particularly interesting in those early chapters as well is that in a lot of ways, cosplay is a kind of fan historiography, that it is the attempt of documenting the ways in which the stories that we are trying to represent and recreate are tied to real history and in a lot of ways the history of clothing in general in ways that are really interesting and really engaging. 
like one of the very early examples in the book is comparing the trend of spacesuits in fan costuming to what people knew or had to learn about how actual astronaut spacesuits were made. And as a result, discovering, hey, these people are accidentally kind of making really good actual spacesuits. And I thought that that was actually kind of interesting, and I wanted to hear more about how you felt discovering that a lot of those elements and practices that from the outside we tend to just presume is just done for entertainment ultimately has a kind of strong cultural and historical backbone to them. Yeah. Cosplay has been a fairly controversial term throughout various fan circles. When I started with Final First Legion back in 2003, 2004, and a lot of people I knew were vehemently like, we are not cosplayers. We're not what we do. And, and I think that part of that is that there were the perception of a connotation that cosplay was sort of a sexual thing. It was because of perceptions about anime and whatnot. It was just the Final First came out of a very different culture. Sorry, anime cosplay and fandom was its own branch, parallel groups sort of coming into existence alongside each other and independently. But yeah, there were people who were just like vehemently, we're not cosplayers. That's, that's not what we do. I think that there's also the implication that like play is, is a bad thing because the Final First is very tied to a lot of charitable work. We do hospital visits, we do charity walks, we raise money. I think some people thought that like play sort of diminishes that, which I don't agree with. I don't think it's accurate at all. So there's that element to it. When I announced the book, the uh, Sci-Fi Wired or Blaster or whatever it was called then, they did an article about it. And I got a couple of comments from people and a couple of emails from people who were like very enmeshed in the traditional capital F fandom community who were also very unhappy about the term cosplay because they basically were like, we don't do cosplay. Like, and again, I think probably for some of the same reasons. I don't know exactly what a lot of those reasons are, but like there was a very heavy emphasis on masquerade or fan costumers. And yeah, the definition has always been kind of interesting because it never really had a name for it. And this is sort of the conundrum that the kid who came up with the term, he was writing for a fanzine in Japan. He's like, I don't know how to describe this. The word for costume doesn't quite accurate. So like you just sort of match the two words up, costume play and cosplay was born. It's a really good term because it does describe what we do. This is a form of play. And I think that play is a really important thing for adults to engage in because it's creative and it's fun and it's liberating in a lot of ways. But before that, people would call it, you know, just costuming or just masquerading or masking. Early on, I was like, eh, cosplay, it's kind of a dumb term, but you know, I've come around to it well before the book, mind. But it, it's, it's one of those things that I've, I think is, is a perfectly good description. And it's just interesting just to see how the terminology and the attitudes have changed. Because a lot of those people that I had been very against the term, you know, they've come around to it. And they're like, oh, I don't care anymore. I'm getting older and it's not something I'm going to worry about what it's called. And a lot of people admit like cosplay is a good catch-all term for what we do. I think that also the rise of anime as a popular medium has also changed a lot of opinions because it, it, that in and of itself has become a much less niche thing than it was 20 years ago. It's much more prevalent and widespread. And I think that, you know, as more people have sampled it and watched anime shows, they're like, all right, it's animation. It's just a different type of thing. And yeah, there's there's a historical element to it. The spacesuits was, was something I really wanted to do because, you know, it, it is sort of that weird connection between fictional and non-fictional type of costuming because science fiction is loaded with spacesuits and there's lots of cool ones. And there's many, many cool spacesuits that I would like to build someday, like replicating the original actual real world ones, which I found really cool. And um, the folks who make the real ones are just, it's the original type of spacesuit. I would very desperately like to get an Apollo type replica in my house somewhere just have just hanging around or just to wear because that would just be very cool <laughs> adam savage has a bunch in his shop that i've seen him videos of him wearing and it's like oh man i just if i had the budget and the, <laughs> the, the resources to commission this type of stuff that would be so cool but there's also an element of like where I really wanted to include stuff that was not science fiction fantasy related because I wanted to really include reenacting because part of my background is military history. I got my master's degree in, in military history from Norwich and that type of history is really important to me. But I've also I've always been fascinated by the folks who do reenactments because it's not really play for them. There's a play element you're dressing up to sort of take part in history, but there's an educational element to it which I've always found fascinating. But there's also, when it comes to living history, like it's like a legit type of research because like, you know, I sort of explain this a little bit. When I was working at a university, Norwich University in Vermont, it's a military academy where I attended. My final project as a senior was researching all the students who fought at D-Day during World War II. Part of that project is I got the school sent me to Normandy with the board of directors and the school president and the former chief of staff of the U.S. Army. 
and a couple of other historians, let's get all the big donors together to sort of show them the value of Norwich's research and value to the community. But while I was there, like the big thing I learned, this was called a staff ride, and it was basically like a college course crammed into a week about this one battle. And going to the battlefield and seeing the locations that I had researched and where people were and sort of standing like, all right, this is where this guy was stringing up telephone poles and wire like around here. And this person landed on this beach and that put a whole new dimension on it. And that's sort of what reenacting does in a really neat way is if you are wearing full wool union uniform in July in Pennsylvania, you are going to get a very good understanding of how stressful that battle was, even if people aren't really shooting at you. It puts a really visceral component onto you just existing on the battlefield. That's an element that I've really been fascinated by because there's also been like academic exercises. There was some university where they basically recruited the university's football team to basically get the big um, Spartan type shields and actually basically try to perform the maneuvers and the techniques and tactics that we imagined were put into play on the battlefield and found that they were woefully inadequate for it just because of the way that they had trained as a football player was not equal to that of a, of a Roman or Greek soldier. And so there's, there's like a historical aspect to that where you can actually, if you are able to immerse yourself in those battlefields and try to add as much fidelity as possible into it, you can glean a good amount of knowledge out of it. One of the things I talk about in the book itself is there's a fort near me, Fort Ticonderoga, which played a pivotal role in the American Revolution. And folks who work there, they are building period costumes like they would have been built back in the 16th, 17th, and 1800s. And they're doing this by looking at the original clothing. One of the cobblers was saying that some archaeologists had unco uncovered a cargo full of shoes and were preserved in you know really fantastic condition. And they were able to glean some really good building techniques out of how to do that and sort of better understand the past because of that. And that was really fascinating just to just sort of see like not only by wearing the clothing, you can sort of understand what, how people might have existed in that world, but you could also by just by building them, you can understand how people, one of the things that he says, Stuart Lilly, the, the VP of, of something over there, he was talking about like how they, you sort of understand people's priorities because like what they would do like the, with the shirts and is that they would like leave extra cloth in so that you could take it out and you could adjust it over time because, you know, people's bodies change over time, you know, and that was something kind of a fascinating moment for me. The science fictional component to this is like with Star Wars, the 501st prides itself on replicating what we see on screen. And one of the things that I really love about my Stormtrooper is that we are building our armor in the exact same way that the original suits were built. It's vacuform plastic. And what a vacuformer is, is it is a piece of equipment that lets you shape plastic. You have a heating element on top. So you clamp your plastic onto a frame. You have it like on like a piston or, or a, like a lever and you can put it up next to the heating element. You heat the plastic up until it's just malleable enough that it's not melted completely or not, it's flexible enough that when you slam it down over a, a mold and turn a vacuum on under it, it sucks all the air out and then sucks the plastic against the mold. And then you pop it off and you cut it out and you have that, that piece of armor. So the 501st, predominantly, the armor that I wear is not all that fundamentally different from what you see on screen. And the process for making it is also sort of replicating the same process that they might have made those costumes with. In some way, you know, that brings you a little bit closer to the film's production. Obviously, like types of armor that you have will vary depending on how good the mold is compared to the original on, on screen. My first set of armor was called an FX suit. And that was made basically of somebody sort of freehanding the design. And it's, it's a pretty close approximation. Like if you see it, you'll see, all right, Stormtrooper. But like if you compare it against the screen used costume, you're like, all right, there are a lot of differences here. And I, I have the, my old FX armor, which I don't wear anymore. And I have a newer version that's much more accurate. And you can see the differences, how much closer it is to the to what was real. The original Stormtrooper helmets are a little bit asymmetrical, so they're a little wonky, whereas some of those fan sets are perfectly symmetrical. So there's to sort of tie that back to sort of the history question, like that sort of build process really sort of takes you not just to the story, but it also tags you to the production itself. You know, and that sort of comes out of the 501st and the, the replica props forms tendencies of people being really fascinated by the film production and wanting to sort of replicate and learn and understand that. And, you know, it has worked out for some of our members. Some of our folks will have appeared in the TV shows and the movies. 
the R2-D2 that was in The Force Awakens, that was made by fans. And in the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show and the Mandalorian TV show, those big groups of stormtroopers that you see, those are 501st members. And so some of that inaccurate armor is now canon because it's now screen used, which is kind of cool. That's actually really cool. So one of the things that came up and I was thinking of a lot of things while you were discussing all these various elements. One I'll say is when you were talking about reenacting and all of the dimensions of that, it made me really think about while this book is about cosplay in particular and does look at some branches of that sort of like costuming branches throughout history and looks at some of the different sort of, you know, there's like what we might call if you were to break things into little boxes, there's, you know, like the like sci-fi cosplay group, which is like fans dressing up as characters from movies and things. And then you have like the reenactments and then all of these, they're all have share a lot of similarities, but then there are all these other branches that can also exist because you made me think of, I don't know, like a decade ago, some group did like a Battlestar Galactica LARP inside like a decommissioned ship. Yep. And I can't remember all the details, but like they basically just reenacted trying to like let the Cylons create all kinds of problems. But it made me think of that. It made me think of also because you mentioned the SEA in this, but also there's this been this huge resurgence like in the last 15 or so years of people engaged in relatively accurate medieval combat as actual tournament combat where you're like beating each other with metal weapons but in armor largely traditional ways and there's just all these like interesting linkages you can go that this book i feel like if you're going into this as like a learning process this world can open up to you i don't like to use the onion reference but it's like layers of onions (laughs) or like tree branches i guess if we're going for really old terrible (laughs) metaphors I don't know how you feel about all of those other connections, Andrew, but that was like one thing that really just stood out to me as I was thinking about what you were saying. I love them. And the the Armored Combat you're talking about is is actually a league, Armored Combat Sports. And it is people dressing up in medieval armor and wailing on each other with stuff. They did a, folks who do a local convention here brought them in for a thing. And like, I'm not somebody who will go to wrestling, but I saw that. I'm like, I got to go see that. So we took my wife, my kids, we took my eight-year-old and my two-year-old. My two-year-old was like, ooh, this is fun. And it was awesome. Again, there are people in armor. And I, I don't know how accurate the armor is compared to like medieval stuff. But yeah, you're trying to, you know, they're wailing on each other and it basically wrestling, but like for nerds. And it was a lot of fun to watch. And and I definitely sort of wanted to get, they're also like at the end of the thing, they're like, all right, who wants to join? You know, come over here and we'll tell you how to do it. And there's a whole lot of guys who are like, yep me so the the thought crossed my mind i just also don't want to come away with a concussion there were people who were bleeding they were really getting smacked around the funny thing is it wasn't like lightsaber fighting where you know they're hitting each other in the swords they were just like most of the time they'd they'd get a couple good hits in it and then they would put the guy in a headlock or like slam their legs and they would like wrestle them to the ground and i have to imagine that to some extent that was probably how a lot of that combat was but you mentioned the SCA, and that's sort of one of the fun things is that the SCA is a not exactly like entirely historically accurate. They are, I, and I'm not a member, and I'm not 100% well versed on every aspect of it. But like, there's an element of storytelling where you are relating to a story of what you imagine medieval Europe to be like. And you know, the the SCA came out of science fiction fandom. Like Paul Anderson was, and Marion Zimmer Bradley were like pivotal to that movement. And it basically started as like sort of a casual, like, we're going to have like a little tournament out at Paul Anderson's house. And, you know, people sort of headed over there. And at that point, they were sort of just imagining like, this is what medieval Europe would have looked like to us and not really putting is this accurate as the primary question. I think it came mostly out of that, you know, they're fantasy writers. This is what they had, you know, stories of King Arthur. So you in a lot of ways, you were sort of dealing with this type of slightly fictionalized version of Europe. And from what I've heard from friends who are part of it become a little bit more modernized. You know, there's a lot of debate about, um, you know, like how accurate things are. And and there's been more pushed, or at least maybe put a little bit more more research into it. It's, It's like one of those things where you're still engaging with like the story of how we imagine medieval Europe to have been like. And, you know, just as time goes on, we just get a a clearer and clearer picture of it based on, you know, actual archaeologists and historians are coming up with. But like cosplay and LARPing do to a certain extent is it is is trying to bring the stories to life for a brief moment into do varying levels of immersion. So like LARPing, you know, you might spend, you know, an afternoon doing it or you might spend a weekend. I know there was a school that was ever maybe slightly before COVID. It was like a witcher school. And you would go and you would basically spend several hundred or a couple thousand dollars to go for a weekend. This is somewhere in Eastern Europe. 
And you'd get outfitted with a costume and, uh, and weapons and you basically live in Witcherland for a little while. And there's that level of, of immersion. I guess we know where Sean's going to go after this podcast. He's going to go look that up. <laughs> but then like for like a regular cosplay character, it might just be that you just need to bring that character to life for just a moment. And, you know, I know I feel it definitely sort of tense up whenever I see somebody dressed up as Darth Vader coming towards me because he's an imposing character. And, you know, there's that visceral fear when you have a group of stormtroopers strutting around barking orders at people like definitely is is a thing that will set you back a step but you know one of the fun things i i see is whenever somebody brings a bb8 or an r2d2 out everybody sort of waves at him yeah and like you know it's not the real thing but like you get down on its level and you wave it aside and you say hi and you, it's real for a minute like you have that feeling of like oh this is not a fan-made thing this is the actual thing and, and the closer costumers get to fidelity the closer people get to accuracy you bring that costume a little bit more life for the people who are around you and that i think is a really great thing i've got a couple friends who do han and chewy and they they look pretty good and my friend mark he's spent a lot of time sort of practicing Chewie's mannerisms and just sort of understanding what makes the character tick. And he's sort of acting as, you know, he knew Peter Mayhew. Peter Mayhew was a big presence in the Final First family, so to speak, you know, because he, he went to cons. We would go and take him out to dinner and he got to know a lot of us. But like, you know, he sort of understood what made the character tick and what made the character appealing and, and what it looked like on screen. And he could replicate that. And when he, he puts the mask on, he becomes Chewbacca. And it's really fantastic just to see him just and, and you know, yelling and, and just waving his arms around and doing all that. And it brings that to life. And, it, you know, as an adult, it's very cool. But like for kids, it's like extraordinary to see because they're like, oh, wow, it's my favorite character. And I've, I've had so many kids come up to me, like either like hug me around the legs or like, you know, you're my favorite character. I had you as an action figure. And I've had so many kids come up and ask me questions like in universe Star Wars questions. Like, what do these buttons do? And like, what do you do if Darth Vader comes and gets you? And like that, I think is really special because, you again it brings the characters to life and it brings the you know the moment of the film to life just a little bit one other example i have that is really fun is that you don't have to necessarily bring the character to life but you can bring a moment or a meme to life have both of you seen uh into the spider-verse yeah and I, there's a picture right in your book yes of this this is amazing <laughs> There's a scene in there when Miles and Peter are escaping from the cafeteria and Peter, uh, is it Miles throws a bagel at somebody and it like bounces off a scientist's head. It, instead of the mm -hmm. pow or bang, it like says bagel in like, you know, over the person's head. And this person has suspended over her head bagel and has a bagel as if it had just like popped off her head. And it's the greatest thing. It's like one of the funniest things I've ever seen, because like if you know that moment, you know that moment. And it's just really funny. It's like this deep deep level nerdity that, you know, we sort of use as a shibboleth for fans like, you know, all right, I've seen that film. I know exactly what that is. And you can sort of identify with those people. It's immersion and it's bringing it to life. But it's also like a, it's a form of, you know, your identity and you're trying to find the other people of your tribe. Mm. And, you know, you can do that through all sorts of mm -hmm. deep references or just, you know, by making a really popular costume. Like, I mean, wearing this, the shirt that I'm wearing right now, it's a, a Boba Fett hoodie. If I wear this around town, people, you know, oh, you're a Star Wars fan. And I've seen other people while wearing this around town, like, oh, hey, you got that shirt too. <laughs> you're a Boba Fett fan or you're a Star Wars fan. And it's very cool. Yeah. So I kind of want to latch on to one of the earlier things that you uh, spoke about just now, which is the ways in which cosplay can awaken real awareness in someone else when you see someone in that costume and how that can be in a lot of ways the tool or the purpose of that cosplay and the reason why i think that that's particularly useful is there is a section in one of the chapters of this book that is dedicated solely to protest cosplay yep. which i think is absolutely radical one of the photo examples that you have in the book is of uh, uh handmaids protesting uh, and i think that that's uh, especially in the present day uh like one of the most publicly available publicly accessible images of what a protest can look like that it's often just as significant to just portray something emotionally resonant for everyone who will get it knowing that the thing that you're supposed to get from that moment is witnessing those people being there and documenting your own feeling about them being present and i think that that's like a really radical kind of thing and i'm very excited to be part of a genre community that sees the value in that and i was kind of wondering like what was your experience documenting that in particular and what kind of things did you learn about 
about protest cosplay as a kind of work, especially as some, a member of the 501st, a community that does a lot of active progressive work, but in a lot of ways, narratively, is portraying <laughs> yeah. the baddies. So the 501st, we often say, you know, we're, we're bad guys doing good. And there's a distinction I want to make here is that in a lot of places, and I've gotten a lot of passive aggressive remarks from coworkers from various places that have worked about like, oh, you know, this is really weird that you are cosplaying as these fascist people, like, like with the implication, like, what does that say about you? You know, there, there's certainly something to be said for dressing up as a costume because you relate to the character. Folks who do Batman really like identify with him really like closely or Superman or Spider-Man because of the things that they embody. And that's sort of the heart of all this, isn't it? It is you see a character and you want to sort of recognize the things that you love about those characters. With Stormtroopers, I certainly don't <laughs> subscribe to the the Empire's ideology, even though I, you know, I dress up as an Imperial Stormtrooper. And I, in that case, I just really like the look and feel of the uniforms. In, in a lot of cases, like with a group like that, it's, it's a bit of an exception because when people see you as a stormtrooper, they don't really see you as like a political statement. They just sort of see you as representing the franchise. And in, in this case, the bad guys just have the better uniforms. That said, I really get a kick out of wearing, I've got a rebel pilot costume that I've started wearing as of a couple of years ago from Rogue One, which I absolutely adore. I have the helmet right here, which I made. Ooh, thank you. It is a very good helmet. It's one of my favorite costumes just because it, it's fairly comfortable to wear, but it's also like, this is a character I really identify with. This is a uh, General Merrick, who is the guy who leads Blue Squadron in, into the Scarif battle. And I like his character because he, you know, they go in without hesitation to this battle and they just know that they're not going to come back alive, but they still do it anyway. When it comes to Star Wars, this is the character I identify with. But, you know, I like dr dressing up as a stormtrooper because the uniform is cool. And, it, you know, when you get a whole bunch of them together, it's a pretty cool thing. A good friend of mine dresses up as both Union and Confederate soldiers. And his rationale for that was like, look, like if we're doing a reenactment, we want to depict both sides as accurately as possible. And, you know, can't just have all Union guys on a battlefield just because that's sort of the good side. You, you want to have the other side there to to sort of represent what fact that they were there. Going deep into the political implications of Confederate cosplay is not something I have done much of, and it's something I would like to do a little bit more of because I think that would be a fascinating deep dive. But when it comes to sort of protest cosplay, the way I got into that is when I was working for a site called The Verge, Handmaid's Tale had just come up and Texas was, was enacting some really terrible laws. And these women decided that it was a, a very visible way to protest was to dress up as the handmaids because they saw that as a very representation of where we were headed depending on whether or not it you know how accurate it is to like what the future looks like it's a story that resonates with a lot of people it's a very vivid because it's a crimson red it's a very distinctive costume it attracts the eye and it attracts a lot of attention. You know, there's a whole, an entire group came up around the U.S. called the Handmaid's Coalition. I, I interviewed a person who was associated with it over in New Hampshire, and they were talking about like, you know, this is how we made the costumes. This is how the group came together. And they put together a plan to have handmade that in front of every state house across the country. The group I don't think is really around, but there are other handmade groups out there that are still using that costume as a way to do that. I think, you know, the reason that that was so powerful is that at the time, a lot of people knew what the costume represented. And I think part of it came about is because Hulu was promoting the series by actually putting people in handmaid's costumes and walking around South by Southwest and, you know, in Texas. And people thought that that was just a really jarring promotion. The show is very political and it, it is very on the nose. So it works really well to sort of attract attention. Actually, the picture in the book, I think, is of um, actors portraying the characters as a promotional thing rather than the actual protesters. That's where I got really interested in it. And that was sort of the thing that I really wanted to include in the book because I, it really speaks to how powerful stories are. It is not just a play thing. It's incredibly powerful technology. It allows us to take a thought and put it into reality. And those stories can change minds. I mean, I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there who have watched The Handmaid's Tale and think, oh, okay, if that's where we're I didn't quite connect with my personal beliefs now in the present to like where this by extrapolating into the future. That's what science fiction is really good at, isn't it? You take the future and you warp it just a bit and extrapolate and just sort of see how twisted it can get. Because eventually, you know, whatever is normal now is going to be, you know, the past down the road and what is seems fantastical will be the new normal.
while researching that piece, I got in touch with a guy who was a Tea Party protester. So back in 2008, when Obama was around, um, the Tea Party movement was very much against taxation and amongst other things. And one of the things that they were doing is they were sending people dressed as the founding fathers to protests, trying to bring out that image of the protesters and you know, the radicals of the American Revolution who went and overthrew the British and trying to sort of capture that story and that feeling for the people around them two different sides of the political spectrum, but they are both approaching it with the same direction, with the same means, is that they're, they're trying to capture those stories. There's other examples too. Like one of the things I, I learned while writing the book was you know, the suffragettes in the early 1900s is that they were dressing up as these, these aspirational characters and the, these heroic female characters like Columbia and Joan of Arc and wading through crowds of men who were hurtling abuse at them to, to sort of you know, make the point that they deserved the vote. And that was a really powerful thing. And the, the pictures that I've, I have a bunch of pictures in the book about it, and they are just, you know, these incredible pictures of these women, really great costumes, bringing this message to people. You know, I think it's a very effective way to convey those political messages because you see those characters and you know what those maybe in 2022, we might not be quite as familiar with Columbia or Lady Liberty or Joan of Arc, but like, you know, 1900s, you would have been a lot more familiar. Nowadays, you know, you might see Wonder Woman has, you know, you see her as sort of a protest symbol. You know, I haven't actually looked at photos of marches past couple of years, you know, women's marches, but I would bet that there is more than one Wonder Woman in the crowd there or one woman dressed as Princess Leia. I know that the iconography of those characters has been on signs, but I don't know specifically about the characters. I'll have to look that up. One of the best troops I've ever done at the 501st is dressing up for Burlington's Pride Parade, where we sort of brought out, we have members of our group that are trans and non-binary and from the LGBTQ community. And, um, you know, we wanted to support them and just sort of have some fun with it. So, you know, we bedazzled all of our costumes and like my short trooper, which has, you know, various colors painted on it. I painted it up, you know, to go with pride. I have a dedicated pride issue shoulder belt that I can slap on and bring it out to another parade down in the future. But that's like another way that you see these characters in that sort of political light these are characters that really sort of embody the best of what we aspire to be you know everybody wants to be princess leia she's feisty she's a strong character she certainly doesn't take shit and she's the perfect social justice embodiment because she's representing this holy good movement against evil and there's a lot of power in those stories and a lot of power in you know using those characters for that There's a guy in the book who, in Turkey, who, to protest Erdogan, dressed up as Darth Vader, you know, and it really sort of got people to sort of like, you know, it captured a lot of attention. These costumes can be used mostly for play, but, you know, there's also, there's reasons why these characters exist. And, you know, especially for something like Star Wars, like it always boggles my mind when people are like, oh, there's too much politics in Star Wars. Like, well, it's got wars in the titles. (laughs) So it sort of comes with the territory. I'm glad you brought that up because that's literally what the Star Wars official Twitter account said like maybe a week ago on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Where they just responded to someone they probably shouldn't have responded to was saying literally Wars is in the title. Yeah. And and all these people are like, what are you talking about? That's not political. And I'm just sitting here going, I really want to respond, (laughs) but I'm not going to. Somehow, the conflict between two large factions is not political. But it's weird because the number of times I've seen... I got in an argument with someone the other day. Well, not an argument. I was just trying to point out this person was basically saying there's no capitalism stuff in Star Wars. And I was like, what do you think the beginning of Phantom Menace is? <laughs> it's literally a war being started <laughs> over a trade dispute. And it's just this kind of weird thing where maybe it's just that sometimes people don't want to think about that it is politics. But it is like Star Wars is a very political story. Yeah. It just also happens to have a skeleton that is very mythological in nature. Yeah. That's fine. Like, why is it an issue? Like, wars are bad. We're not supposed to like the war in Star Wars. We want it to end. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a, there's a tendency for people not to want stuff shoved in their faces, but they also don't really understand that that's sort of a luxury. Yeah. There's an element of these stories where there are these implications, but if you sort of put them in the background and put them into subtexts, you can ignore them a little bit. I think there's value in trying to see and treat fiction as an escapist thing, especially if it's something where you have grown up with it and it's something that, you know, when you were a kid, you didn't understand the subtext. You don't really maybe don't want to see it when you go back and rewatch it. But, you know, yeah, like it's always been there and the floating around in the background, like George Lucas was incredibly moved by Richard Nixon's various problems and the Vietnam War Mm -hmm. and, you know, listening to World War Two veterans talk about stuff. It's all in that mix. There's torture in the first Star Wars movie. There's torture, darn it. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> it's easier to sort of like come to the newer things and sort of see it nowadays. Whereas back then you might, it might've also been fairly overt, but you've just not, when you see something as a kid, you just don't pick up on it. So I, I can sort of sympathize with folks who don't want it to be shoved in their faces. And from a storytelling perspective, yeah, if, if you do it really badly, it doesn't work really well because it's just crappy storytelling, but the mere existence of, you know, acknowledging very basic things is not really a hardship. Yeah, well, like one of the more spectacular meltdowns I saw is that there is a trans clone trooper um, named Sister. And like there were people who were like, Bruh! you know, it was like breaking the brains. And it's like, well, look at the real world. <laughs> also, yeah, they have aliens with like nine eyes in Star Wars. You can't have a trans trooper. Uh, Come on. Nope. Like, they have aliens that reproduce asexually in Star Wars who are otherwise like humans. <laughs> Yeah. You've got clones. A human can understand a language that is made up entirely of grunts. Yeah! But cannot speak it. Well, that's not true. He does speak it in Solo. Whether or not he's very good at it is a different question. <laughs> but you draw the line at the trans person. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, one of the other... Oh, I was going to say, like, one of the things I really want to see people cosplay, I want... Somebody has got to cosplay as sister at some point. Like, it's it's sort of inevitable. I have a spare episode three bucket. Very tempted to say, I should paint that up and just... Oh. Gift that to someone. Oh, no. Put that up on my wall or something and just, like, put it out on a, on a table when we, when we do something. I haven't gotten around to it. I mean, to properly do it, having a trans cosplayer dress up as that character... The other thing here is that if we're talking about identity and, you know, these franchises like Star Wars was very much Western white story. Like there's not a lot of people of color in it. One of the things I've really appreciated about what Disney has done is that they have really brought more diversity to the world, just even in the background. Like you see more characters of color, you see more women. When you see those characters, you know, as, as a white kid from Vermont, yeah, I identify with Luke Skywalker or Han Solo because, you know, he looks like me. He's the embodiment of what I, I could very well become him without doing anything all that different. Seeing those characters acknowledged and recognized is good validation for folks. It's a good way for people to come into the cosplay community without having to deal with the abuse that's hurtled at them because they are like daring to dress up or change what a character looks like. I've heard of, you know, African-American cosplayers who dress up as Batman or like get people yelling at them. I spoke with a, a woman who dressed up as Zelda. It's a phenomenal take on the character, but people were being awful to her online because she's black. Cosplay isn't canon at all. And it's, it's one of those things that you can endlessly remix. And it's like one of those things like, you know, you can mash up Deadpool with anything and you're having trouble imagining what this character might look like, you know, as a black woman or as a, any other variation or any other race. Like, come on, your reason here is not out of the sanctity of the character or, or whatever. Yeah. Other issues at play. Yeah, because I was going to say it like obviously clashes with as you said, the other urge that a lot of fans already have about their favorite work that I just want to enjoy this thing and escape this thing and not have to think about politics. But when other people who are not you want to do the exact same thing, suddenly their existence is political. So we acknowledge that there are some things that are inherently political, no? Yep. So yeah, th those kinds of clashes kind of strike and stand out to me. And that's why I was particularly glad one of the things that I was definitely going to talk about was those sections of the book about uh, race and gender because in a lot of circumstances, those cosplayers really just want to enjoy the thing that everybody else is enjoying. Yeah. I mean, I live in a country where the majority of the population is people of color. I know a lot of black cosplayers. Yeah. They're just doing the thing that they enjoy. A lot of the time for them, it is not political, but it kind of starkly clarifies that there is something inherently political about these stories that we enjoy. And in a lot of ways, being able to experience it and escape in it as a person of color, as a trans person, as a queer person, is in and of itself the power of cosplay. That even if I can't be in this world, in the story itself, I can be in this world now. Yeah. It's kind of powerful. There's a, a really good friend of mine here in Vermont. Their name is Thorne, and they dress up as a Mandalorian. And they have a kick-ass Mandalorian. And one of the things that they were talking about was they felt really liberated in having a character with a helmet because they could sink into the character and not have people they could present as male or female. And there's they're sort of trending more towards male, but they could, you know, they, they could present themselves in that way. They would blend in better, I guess, is maybe for lack of a better term. You know, they had the helmet. They didn't have somebody, you know, sort of like looking twice at them. It's like, oh, it's just another Mandalorian. And they're talking about how the group, the Mandalorian Mercs that they're part of, was also very welcoming and that the ethos of the Mandalorian culture sort of this is sort of bleeding into the fan group where it's so, sort of like a found family and where like you are part 
part of a clan that has come together, not out of blood, but out of circumstance. And it's really powerful, I think. It's one of the things that, you know, cosplay sort of also unlocks is that you can be a person who, you know, really likes Wonder Woman. If you're a guy, you can dress up as Wonder Woman. If you are a um, a trans woman, this can be an aspiration that you can fulfill is, is by dressing up as that character. And I've seen people do that. And that's a really powerful thing because, again, it, it helps validate your identity and it helps. The fortunate thing is that a majority of the cosplay community is very welcoming. And it, there's a lot of encouragement for folks to do this stuff and to build these characters and to sort of portray them to the best of your ability. And whether that is, you know, encouraging you in building technique or the final presentation, it's, it's really inspiring. And it really, you know, it, it speaks really well to the cosplay community. And, I, and every now and then you'll get people who will be like, well, that's not completely canon. But again, like canon is, is really, is, it's irrelevant in a lot of ways. I mean... There's some elements of like the 501st has some pretty strict requirements for entry, but part of the point of the group is to replicate as closely as possible stuff that you see from the film. Certainly the 501st, the Rebel Legions are not the end all and be all of the, the Star Wars cosplay world. You can do whatever you want. And, you know, if you want to do a, a Deadpool Stormtrooper, you, you can do that. You can use all the building techniques you learn from the 501st and do that. You might not be able to be a member with that costume, but, you know, there's, there's still a costuming community out there that is sympathetic to it. And, you know, even 501st members will think that's pretty cool. <laughs> We, we have members who are like an Elvis trooper who has bedazzled his uniform and there's a Bengals tiger trooper and there's other things. So like perfect canon is not the end all and be all of this stuff. One of the things that I think is like a really interesting through line in this book, and it bounces off a lot of what we're talking about here, is that in a lot of ways, whether we're thinking the more direct cosplay community or other variations of it, costume partings and those kinds of things, that what cosplay affords, and this is a thing you mentioned in the book and talk about, that it, it, it allows people to sort of express themselves, to explore themselves, to be these unique characters, but also in a way that is kind of liberating from any kind of restriction. Like this idea of canon kind of boils down to absurdity in a lot of cosplay. Like if you go to a, a big anime convention in the United States, <laughs> yes, there'll be a very significant number of, of Asian American and people from Asia at that. But there's also a metric fuck ton actual weight of mostly white people <laughs> and some some black people as well. There won't be as many, but there are more now, I think, than they used to be. And they'll all be dressing up as characters from their favorite shows, many of which in some cases explicitly those characters are are meant to be Japanese. Mm -hmm. But the idea behind that to me has always seemed like you don't need to be Japanese to be these characters in these moments. This is about expression and, and your love and adoration of the creations that there isn't a commentary necessarily being made about, you know, the racial dimensions of the character. It's more of an expressionary thing. And so a lot of what you were talking about, Andrew, and in the book, you talk about in a lot of different ways about the way that people treat cosplay as, as an expression of self and as a very freeing activity activity because absent of the politics of the real world it is a space that you can be anything theoretically for heaven's sakes when i was a kid i went as ryu and a ninja and also as a jedi all in the same character for <laughs> halloween that's because you were a nerd sean i just went you know what screw it <laughs> i was a nerd i was such a nerd <laughs> I was all three. Do you still have pictures? Yeah, you gotta you gotta throw them out there. There's probably a picture somewhere in my baby book. Yeah, you do. You know when this episode goes live, you need to put that picture yeah. next to the picture of Andrew's book on the page now. Okay, I'll ask my mom if there's a picture somewhere. Yeah, like, there's no rules. Like, nobody told me as a kid, like, well, you can't do that, right? There are some hard and fast rules, you know, societal rules. Blackface is a new new. I had a really interesting conversation a couple years ago with a friend. Can a white person cosplay as Black Panther? Yeah, which is a really interesting thing because because that character is so rooted in black identity and it's definitely not something I would be comfortable doing. Sort of like Thin Ice, like you, you want to make sure that you sort of represent that character accurately and sensitively just because of the context around it. This is all sort of contextual, you know, sort of case by case thing. I don't think that there's any hard and fast rules here. Um, certainly like a white cosplayer sure. dressing up in blackface to do Chichala, like that, that no, you don't do that. No, that's a hard line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is exactly the limit that I would have drawn. You can cosplay as Black Panther because no one knows who you are under the mask. Yeah. But you can't cosplay as T'Challa because how? Yeah. <laughs> you could replicate the costume 100% based on what you see in the film. There's a real sensitivity to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't see anybody really, really wanting to sort of, you know, kick that hornet's nest just because of the, the nature of the world we live in. I, I think it's complicated and there's no... 
we always like to have simple and straightforward answers and like, you know, if this, then this, but you know, those don't, those very rarely exist in the real world. But yeah, like Black Panther, like when he's got the mask on, like, I don't, I don't really see any problem with that. Like my kid watched um, Into the Spider-Verse and loved Miles Morales and, you know, for Halloween, we dressed. I picked up a Miles Morales Spider-Man costume because he he just loved the look of the costume. He dressed up as him and was flipping off the walls and climbing. You know, I put him on top of the wood uh, on top of the shed behind my house, and he wouldn't get down. And you know, he had a lot of fun with it. So <laughs> you can certainly like if you want to make you want to go like one hundred percent accuracy and, and do it. You can certainly do it. It's just it's not really good taste. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're pointing out like a very good thing, which is. You know, there, there is a degree of sensitivity required in yeah. in it. But there's also like that's maybe even not a hard and fast rule because, you know, like kids maybe just expressing and exploring characters. They don't understand that world mm. where that might become more insensitive. At that point, the kids are kind of expressing their love of a character yeah. in a way that might be different than in an adult context. And uh, yeah, absolutely. There, there are certainly like don't going and no going into like the hard racism thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. and blackface has, and this is not something I really got into deeply with the book. There's such a cultural context around it. Yeah, that makes it a, sort of a prohibition. I don't personally see any hard and fast rules about like you can't dress up as as any of these characters. You just have to do so in a way that isn't racist. Right. There's certainly examples of that that pops up around Halloween every year from some stupid college kids will will do this stuff. But locally where I am, my, my parents have a house in up like way upstate New York and the Lake Association does a Fourth of July parade every year and they have a theme. And this year's theme is Hawaiian. And they were they were like, you can um, you know I have to find the exact wording because it is pretty spectacular. And I see no way that this is going to backfire at all to all you boaters who plan on entering the boat parade, be creative. Hawaii has many cultures. So be brave and strut your stuff as a Samoan warrior, hula dancer, drummer, or spear thrower. Yeah. (laughs) How about you don't, how about no, how about Mm -mm. you don't do that? Oh, oh Lord. I really, I really kind of, yeah, that was, (laughs) uh, so returning to your wonderful book, then, (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I feel like one of the questions that I definitely do want to ask, especially because I do think that your book is written very accessibly for people who know who know nothing about cosplay, who perhaps never have seen one, although I highly doubt that no one's ever seen a cosplay before or has never put it in this like wider context. What do you want someone who is not a part of the community to get from your book? I want them to understand that it is a community full of creative passionate and dedicated people who love this whatever story that they're recreating. We're talking about people who have spent decades doing this type of work. Next year, I will literally have had my Stormtrooper armor for 20 years. I know people who have dumped, I don't know, nine, ten thousand, twelve thousand dollars $10,000, $12,000 into getting the most perfect Boba Fett suit that they can get. And just by years and years of just buying incremental parts and paint, and they might wait for two years to get a helmet painted by sending it to somebody who's really good at that sort of thing. You are talking about people who will look at a material in a certain way and say, I can take that. I can turn that into armor. And like what they're looking at is a yoga mat. And EVA foam is phenomenal material for making costumes. These are people who will find a workbench full of crap and cobble together a costume. I'm on the cover of the book. In the lower right-hand corner, there's a guy with a helmet and a white thing, and that's me. That costume is made up of a Chinese fighter jet helmet that I had kicking around from the Expanse as a screen used. That helmet wasn't screen used, but that was the prop, the helmet that they used for one of the astronaut helmets that I've been planning on painting up to look like an Expanse thing. There's a broken up radio. There's a uh, Walkman, a toolbox, a whole bunch of those little wire connector things that I added on there. There's bits of a flashlight. There's pieces of Stormtrooper armor. It's an Xbox power supply. <laughs> bit of radio. This is all just stuff I cobbled together because I was trying to put together a costume like, oh, like I can put this together, make it look like this. Now, all of a sudden, after a couple of coats of paint, I've got an astronaut costume that, you know, I'm out exploring. You know, you've got people who do that sort of thing. And like, you know, these are, this is how like a lot of those those classic costumes are made. People are just throwing shit together, painting it up and making it weathered and making it look like it was part of the world. And, you know, there's a lot of creative people out there who you know, this is just the perfect outlet for them because they just get to make stuff. They get to build it and they get to like spend time getting the paint job on their costume really perfect or getting the the fine detail in, an, in a set of armor done. So I, I really want to convey that, you know, this is a, a very passionate body of people and that they, these are people who are really in tune with the stories and that they just want to bring some level of joy to their lives or to the lives of the people around them. 
And it's a fascinating community to be, be a part of. And that yet, like, it is a community. Like when I, I went to celebration back in May, and it was very easy to find the fellow 501st members. Um, I, I, anytime I go to a con or if I have to fly, I always like to play the game. Is this, is this a weirdo or is this somebody who's going to the con? And <laughs> you can usually figure out, like, especially with 501st members, you, you know who they are right away because they've got the patches. They've got like racing shirts or whatever. And when I went to Anaheim, I went to lot. I flew into LAX and at the other end of the airport while I was waiting for my bags, I found two 501st members and we started talking and we became friends. Like, you know, I, I had a panel with some other longtime 501st members. I knew one of them pretty well. I knew some of them sort of well. Came out of the con like really pretty close. You know, we form those connections because we are fans and because we we like the same thing. And, and this is the thing I like about cosplay is it is a an art form that transcends boundaries. It transcends political boundaries. It transcends race, gender, you know, even franchise. Sometimes, sometimes we'll talk to the Star Trek people. So not, not always. <laughs> <laughs> This is what society needs the most. It needs those connections. Like even if you don't necessarily have a lot in common with somebody, you have that one thing in common. And if you meet somebody, you you have face-to-face -face contact and you make those personal relationships. I think that is a powerful thing. And that's something that we need more of. I hope that comes through. I, it's one of the real important things about the vocation is that it is a way to connect to people. And as I said, we need, that's something we need more than ever. And it's just really cool. It's, it's really cool to walk around as a stormtrooper and just, pose for pictures with people or, or whatever character you're dressed up as or dressing up as a super niche character that like maybe one person at the con might recognize you. But I've got a jumpsuit from the 2009 film Moon, the Duncan Jones movie, and one or two people might recognize it. But, you know, hey, we're Moon fans, you know, <laughs> it's that, that one film that we, we all love. So, well, great. Well, what I'm hearing is that Brandon and I are going to have to go as characters at a convention one to these days. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fun experience. How about this? You could be Finn from Star Wars and Abu Babu Freak. Oh, God. <laughs> I have no idea how that's going to work, but we'll make it work. <laughs> Babu Frick will be in the next season of The Mandalorian, apparently. Yeah, I'm very stoked because <laughs> such a cute little dude. <laughs> I have not seen one yet, but I'm sure that there are people who are working on the puppets to do them themselves. Um, at Celebration, I saw somebody doing BD-1 from uh, Jedi Fallen Order. A newsletter subscriber of mine does him and he has he has him on a glove and he's actually got able to manipulate him so he gets the ears to go up and down and the eyes you know the whole thing to move like a puppet it's pretty spectacular it's just really cool to see i'm looking forward to it that i can't wait so you might need to go deep you talk to mary robin at koala about puppetry and i'm sure you could put something together yeah the other thing that i'll throw in here is that i talked about this being a story about community it's also a story about in some ways it's an economic story because you're talking about how do you expand a community you Back 1930s, 40s, 50s, you know, it was a very limited community because it was only science fiction fans or sorry, SF fans, not, not sci-fi. Capital F fandom, like, you know, that's a very small group of people, several hundred maybe, you know, in all of the U.S. around that time. And then how do you build that community? You, you break down barriers and, and lives access. And that happens in a lot of ways. You, you break down the inherent racial barriers or the, the gender barriers that sort of keep women and people of color out. You increase access to the content. So like when Star Trek came around in 1966, that brought so many people to Star Trek because not as many people read the magazines, but a lot of people watch TV. Yeah, you know, that brought more people in. Star Wars, lots of people watch that. A lot of this stuff was locked away in forums or fanzines. But then when you say you introduce a platform like YouTube, where you have, you can literally type in, like if you were to go to YouTube right now and type in how to build a Stormtrooper, you will find gazillions of videos of people going over every single part on how to build that Stormtrooper. 3D printing lets you, if you know the price on a 3D printer has come down dramatically. For a fun fact, the, the patents expired on the original technology, you know, within the past couple of decades. And as a result, the price comes down. Yeah. So that I could not afford a $10,000 printer in my basement, but I can afford a $250 one and I have a snap maker and I make little things for my ch children and sometimes armor parts. <laughs> and if I'm very, very patient and I have the ability to slice up, I, I could, you know, theoretically make an entire suit of armor on that four by four print bed. I'm not going to do that because that would be a lot of time and energy, but that I don't have, but uh, you can do it. <laughs> And so as each of these barriers comes down, you can increase the community just a little bit more because more people can access it. Vacuum forming a stormtrooper requires a lot of specialized equipment. But if you know how to manipulate foam and you have, you know, a couple of sheets of EVA uh, foam, like the same stuff that's used in yoga mats and a heat gun and a razor blade, you can carve that into any shape you want, form it into any shape you want, and you can make a pretty good stormtrooper that way. 
and it might be a lot cheaper than vacuum formed kit. You know, vacuum formed kit might cost you about five hundred to a thousand dollars. Drop the price point on that. Uh, a couple of years ago, there's a company called Anovos, which is not around anymore for a whole bunch of reasons, but they wanted to sort of drum up a lot of interest. So they sold their Stormtrooper for 250 bucks and a lot of people bought them. You could see an immediate spike in 501st membership because all of a sudden $500 is a lot to drop on a suit of armor that you know requires a good amount of skill to put together. $200, 250 bucks, you might be able to do that depending on where, you know, where, where you are economically, you know. Yeah that's something that's doable. And so, you know, you, you increase the community that way. And so that's another element to this is that community inherently is, is trying to find more people. And the more you increase access, the more you spread to more things, the more you remove gatekeepers and the people who are trying to defend their, their turf from their corners of the, of the nerd world, the more people join and the more people who join, the more viewpoints, the more perspectives, the more, you know, you might have somebody who comes in who might be your best friend. Or you might have somebody who has a really novel idea like, oh, if you do this, you know, if you can use this material in this way that nobody's ever thought of before. And that's how communities grow and evolve and change. And, um, you know, that's the way it's been trending the past couple of decades. And it's great because a lot of more people can take part in this weird, wonderful hobby. Huh. Yep. Well, we, we could talk more and more and more and more about all the different and fun and exciting aspects of cosplay, of which there are way too much. And if we kept talking, then people would have learned too much from the book. And then that would defeat the purpose of us wanting to talk about it because we want people to buy it because it's really good. <laughs> it's a good book. Thank you. For now, uh, obviously, by the time this goes out, I'm pretty sure the book will be out. So where can folks find you later in the year? Any particular events where people might find you? There's a couple of other cons that I'm hoping to go to. Rhode Island Comic Con later, that's November. Fan Expo Boston, which is September or October, I'm hoping to go to. Uh, Granite State Comic Con, I'll be on the, already been confirmed for that. And I'll be online and as well. I've, I've got a newsletter that I write that called Transfer Orbit. And I'll be, I'm hoping that if I have time and energy, I'll be able to write some quote unquote lost chapters, that stuff I didn't quite get to in the book, which should be pretty fun. I've got a short list of stuff. I, I literally ran out of room and literally ran out of time to work on the book. You know, there's just some stuff that we just were not able to get in. And so hopefully that'll be a thing to do. And you have a website and your socials bound to some degree. <laughs> yes. So I, you can find me on Twitter at Andrew Liptak, all one word. On Instagram, you can find me at Liptak AA, Liptaka. And the newsletter I write is Transfer Orbit, transfer orbit.ghost.io. If you just type in Andrew Liptak newsletter, you'll find it. Or ask Sean over and over again online, if, how do I find Andrew's stuff? He will happily supply it to each and every one of you. And uh, I've got a Facebook page. If you just type in Andrew Liptak, you should come across it. Not on TikTok. I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> AndrewLiptak.com. Just Google the name or you'll find me somewhere. I'm yeah. probably lurking. You're lurking somewhere. Lurking, I'm sure. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. This was really dope. I'm very excited about other people discovering this book because I think that it's really rad. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. As I said, this the, the idea came in about 2016. So I've been working on it for about six years. And... For that entire time, it's a, it's a project that's been in my head and on my on my computer. And, you know, you don't know until people start to read it if, if it's any good. And I'm, I'm really thrilled that you guys really like it. And other people have liked it because, A, I, I guess I sort of know what I'm doing. But it's sort of, sort of like the, the Charlie from Always Sunny, the picture of him with the the conspiracy theory board behind him. And that's sort of like what my brain, <laughs> it's sort of like what my brain is like because there's all these different connections. And... <laughs> It's just making sure that it all makes sense. And hopefully it does. And I'm hoping that people really enjoy it and come to it and either come away inspired or come away at least learning a little bit more about the world of cosplay. And I will have succeeded in some part if somebody reads it and decides like, hey, maybe I can cosplay something and actually goes and, and builds a costume. And that's you. I really hope, wish you best of luck. And I, I'm excited to see what you come up with. Awesome. And I think I speak for all of us when I say we hope to see those people at a con at some point in the future. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So awesome. As for us on this podcast, if you'd like to let us know what you thought about this episode, or if you've read the book and you have any thoughts about the book and that, that you'd like to share with us, please head on over to skiffyandfanty.com slash listener suggestions. Also, please follow us at Skiffy and Fanty on Twitter and Instagram, and please subscribe to our newsletter at skiffyandfanty.com slash newsletter. And finally, if you like what we do, please support us at patreon.com slash skiffy and fanty so we can continue doing these cool things. And please give us some love by just leaving a five-star review on iTunes. It costs no effort whatsoever to let people know that you think that this podcast is dope.
As for me, you can find Brandon O'Brien at The Rising Tides on Twitter, patreon.com slash the rising tides, and on speculatesf.com where I currently GM Fractal Spire, a girl by moonlight actual play. And you can find me at Sean Duke on Twitter, SeanDuke.net, Alphabet Streams on Twitch, and patreon.com slash the joy factory. And as I noted, we are going to cosplay, but I've changed my mind, mm-hmm. Brandon. We're not going to do Finn and uh, Babu Free. Mm-hmm. We're instead going to go as a very large orange and a very large straw. I love it. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. So here, I'm going to throw in my tip for doing that. To make that costume really pop, what you need to do is make a giant sticker with the UPC code. Every piece of fruit that you ever have, Mm -hmm. yeah, you have to peel the sticker off. You have to put one of those on there. Yes. And that will make it just that much cooler. Yeah, it would be great. Yeah, that's awesome. We're going to do it. All right. I I expect to see that at a con. Yeah, I guess we have to work on that now. Uh, One day. Yep. (laughs) We got to now. And on that note, awkward ending and scene. If you want to support this show, you can go to patreon.com slash skiffyandfanty or skiffyandfanty.com, our website, where you can get access to all of our fancy things. Our music comes from Holy Mole. You can support him and his work at patreon.com slash holy mole. Thank you for listening. <laughs>